Okay, well, it's the ice cream truck is here, and when the ice cream truck is here, the Meta Dojo is in session, a continuation of Anthony DeMello's The Way to Love. You know, the plan originally, oh, I don't know, two, three months back, I don't know, was to read two meditations a week, and had I manifested that, I'd be done by now. But, uh, you know, growing up, waking up, cleaning up, showing up, slowly, it's bright, this light's very bright, <laughs> slowly, uh, slowly, slowly de-addicting myself from various um, things I think I can't live without. Maybe I can't. <clears throat> Probably I can't, and then I'll uh, die in some metaphorical way, and then move on to the self that is free, maybe. I don't know. From here, you know, you really can't see that you're not, um, that you're missing something when you're the four-year-old who doesn't have the perspective yet to take a ball that is two-colored, two-sided, two red on one side, green on the other, and you show them. Hey, you're looking at the green side, four-year-old. What side am I seeing? They don't have the developmental tools yet to say you're seeing red. They just say you're seeing green because green is being seen and that kind of extrapolation isn't. Uh, it's an innovative and novel cognitive move. And uh, you gotta get there at some point. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sensing this deep four-year-oldness of like, not, <clears throat> I'm just sensing being really close to being able to square a bunch of apparent circles. And, uh, oh, it's gonna be so beautiful. Is that real? Is it my ambition actually attainable? This, like, Uber mentioned flow state, kind of like aligning all of my wants, first order, second order, third order wants, the, uh, the here now pleasure seeker hedonist, the bodhisattva who wants to help save all beings from suffering, the uh, the uh, the creative adept and the romantic and the friend and the family member and the okay, it's actually really just like two fundamental. The here now, the later, the self is defined by me, the self is defined by community, the self is defined by spirit, creativity, something like that. And uh, boy, a lot of conflict here in this 32 year old, uh, you know, thing that you're looking at. So today's first essay will be called No Stone Will Be Left. Oh, and I'm also. I just have to add, when the camera's in front of me, there's a wonderful, reliable, deep sense of depersonification, depersonifying, non-personalness. It's just a, some a hugely human thing is that is what I'm going through, and it's just like, oh, it's so not unique to me. It's so, it's so all of us, and it's really quite touching and beautiful to feel so connected to the rest of me, which is you. Lawrence, you're adorable, you're adorable. Okay, no stone will be left unturned, and if this phone rings, well, we're trying to uh, make a little uh, spiritual sweet, sweet, idea romance oh, oh you're trying to crash bitcoin is that what you're trying to do oh no you're trying to spike even more fun okay the essay begins now that we are saving and i'm gonna read one read another play song that's the uh that's the agenda for today we'll keep it as short as we can but um actually no i don't give a shit about keeping it short i don't even give a shit about your enjoyment. This is purely for my own 
edification at this point while I work my way <coughs> into um, the most adept intramimetic tribe communicator the world has ever known. Yes, my lovely friends of all propositional stripes. We're not going to have to kill each other or even name call. No stone will be left unturned. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. This is Matthew 24. One and two. We've got two quotes today. Think of a flabby person covered with layers of fat. Hey, Anthony DeMello, stop with your fat shaming. What is, that is what your mind can become. Oh, you're using a metaphor. Okay. That is what your mind can become. Flabby, covered in layers of fat till it becomes too dull and lazy to think, to observe, to explore, to discover. It loses its alertness, its aliveness, its flexibility, and it goes to sleep. Look around you and you will see almost everyone with minds like that. Dull, asleep, protected by layers of fat, not wanting to be disturbed or questioned into wakefulness. What are these layers? Every belief that you hold, every conclusion that you have reached about persons and things, every habit and every attachment in your formative years, you should have helped, been helped to scrape off these layers and liberate your mind. Instead, your society, your culture, which puts these layers on your mind in the first place has educated you not to even notice them, to go to sleep and to let other people, the experts, your politicians, your cultural and religious leaders, do your thinking for you. I'm just going to raise my hand and say guilty as charged. I don't know to what extent I'm guilty as charged. I attempt to do my thinking for myself, I like Anthony DeMello to do my thinking for me. That that I admit to. Uh, so you are, but this is feeling thinking. This is meta stuff. This feels different than uh, watching. Yeah, the um, distinctly political, cultural, or religious. Um, distinctly cultural, political, or political or religious uh, worldviews. Like this is attempting to do a little bit of a, a bigger move. Anyway, DeMello, I'm yours. Let's continue. So you're, uh, you're weighed down with a load of unexamined, unquestioned authority and tradition. You got that right. And we're, we're starting to externalize it, take a look at it, and uh, assess what's useful. At the moment, I think we're in, uh, phew, it's all bathwater mode. It's a broad statement. But uh, I think it's, it's uh, I, don't, I don't know, I don't predict the future. I have no idea. We could all be dead very soon. Uh, let us uh, examine these layers one at a time. First, your beliefs. If you experience life as a communist or a capitalist, as a Muslim or a Jew, you're experiencing life in a prejudiced and slanted way. There's a barrier, a layer of fat between reality and you because you no longer see and touch it directly. Second layer, your ideas. If you hold on to an idea about someone, then you no longer love that person, but your idea of that person. It's beyond profound, that idea. It's overwhelmingly impossibly it 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 takes your valued discretion and reminds you of its intrinsic biases. Yeah, that's what it does. If you hold on to that. Okay, so uh, here we go. If you hold on to an idea about someone, you no longer see that person but your idea of that person. You will see him, her, do or say something or behave in a certain kind of way and you slap a label on it. She is silly or he is dull or he is cruel or she is very sweet, etc. So now you have a screen, a layer of fat between you and this person because when you next see him, you will experience them in terms of that idea of yours 
even though they have changed. Observe how you have done this with almost everyone you know. Uh, sure. Guilty. Feeling a little bit of resistance to what you're saying, DeMillo, in that something in my memory architecture is useful when I see Adam. It's nice to remember his name is Adam. It's just not useful to pretend like I know what's coming from this incredible being called Adam who will meet me in the present moment and dance with me. Uh, okay, you will experience them in terms of that idea uh, and they will have changed. Okay, observe how you've done this with others everyone you know. Right. Third layer, habits. A habit is essential to human living. Yes, how would we ever talk or walk or speak or drive a car unless we relied on habit? But habits must go must be limited to things mechanical. Ooh, I love it. But habits must be limited to things mechanical, not to love or to sight. Who wants to be loved from habit? Have you ever sat on a seashore, a seashore spellbound by the majority? Have you ever sat on a seashore spellbound by the majesty and the mystery of the ocean? A fisherman looks at the ocean daily and does not notice its grandeur. Why? The dulling effect of a layer of fat called habit. You have formed fixed ideas of all the things you see and when encountering them it is not them you see and all their changing freshness but the same dull thick boring idea acquired through habit. And that is how you deal with people and with things. How you relate to them. No freshness, no newness, newness but the same dull boring routine ways produced by habit. <laughs> Excuse me. You are incapable of looking in other, more creative ways for having developed a habit for dealing with the world and with people. You can put your mind on automatic pilot and go to sleep like Barnaby here. Fourth layer, your attachments and your fears. This layer is the easiest one to see. Put a thick coating of attachment of fear and therefore dislike onto anything or anyone and the very instant you cease to see that person or thing as it really is just recall some of the persons you dislike or fear or attached to uh, and you will see how true this is Lottie it's my cat now my little sister do you see how you are in a prison created by the beliefs and traditions of your society and culture, and by the ideas, prejudices, attachments, and fears of your past experiences? Wall upon wall surrounds your prison cell, so that it seems almost impossible that you will ever break out and make contact with the richness of life and love and freedom that lies beyond your prison fortress. And yet the task, far from being impossible, is actually easy and easy. Delightful. Tell me more, Anthony DeMillo, because I read this stuff and... What can you do to break out? Four things. Easy and delightful things. First, realize that you are surrounded by prison walls, that your mind has gone to sleep. It does not even occur to most people to see this, so they live and die as prison inmates. Most people end up being conformists. They adapt to prison life. If you become reformers, they fight for better living conditions in the prison, better lighting, better ventilation. Hardly anyone becomes a rebel, a revolutionary who breaks down the walls. You can only be a revolutionary when you see the prison walls in the first place. Second, I, I just hear, I hear him say, the walls and it's like all concepts all symbolic all symbols all images everything that is not direct perceptory perceptual sensory experience is subject to expectation bias and it's like top down what are my expectations up what are my sense what are my sensation direct experiences and they meet in the middle very interesting uh, yeah, second, contemplate these walls. Spend hours, right, just observing your ideas, your habits, your attachments, and your fears without any judgment or condemnation. Look at them, and they will crumble. 
Third, spend some time observing the things and people around you. Look, but really look as if it were for the very first time at the face of a friend, a leaf, a tree, a bird in flight, a behavior and mannerism of the people around you. Really see them. Hopefully you will see them afresh as they are in themselves without the dulling, stupefying effects of your ideas and habits. I wonder what kind of stupefying ideas and habits I have about you, Barnaby, that prevents me from seeing you in your full illuminated goodness and fresh alive uh, spontaneity. All that fresh alive spontaneity, Barnes? E all right, we're almost there. The fourth and most important step. Sit down quietly. That's, that's what it says, just to sit down quietly. And it's like the rest of the book is just blank pages, so I guess we'll just sit here now. Sit down quietly and observe how your mind functions. There is a steady flow of thoughts and feelings and reactions there. Yeah, no shit. Watch the whole of it for long stretches of a time, the way you watch a river or a movie. I get swept up in the river or a movie when I do that. My powers of concentration are uh, potentially improvable. But I done with you. Uh, right, you'll soon find it so much more absorbing, absorbing than any river or movie will I and so much more life-giving and liberating. After all, can you even be said to be alive if you're not even conscious of your own thoughts and reactions? The end of life, it is said, is not worth living. It cannot be called life. It is a mechanical robot existence, a sleep, an unconsciousness, a death, and yet this is what people call human life. So watch, observe, question, explore, and your mind will come alive and shed its fat and become keen and alert and active. Your prison walls will come tumbling down till not one stone of the temple will be left upon another. You'll be blessed with the unimpeded vision of things as they are, the direct experience of reality. I like how he tied it together at the end. So the no stone left unturned is indeed an attempt to examine your own interior. know exactly what it means either and yet I have a tremendous and uh, indefatigable faith that um, growth will occur waking up will occur cleaning up will occur showing up will occur why do I have this faith? Do I misuse this faith? I wonder if I paint this faith on so as to continue an endless charade of habitual dysfunction. Okay, it's being a little hyperbolic at myself. Uh, a capping of potential artificially occurs maybe is this just judgment I just like I'm not doing what I need to be doing what I can be doing what I have the skills to be doing just shaking head judging self I am so bad I am so negative I am so so not the thing I need to be oh it hurts it sears it is uncomfortable to look at and yet I know this is going slow maybe we'll just do one today no nah, fuck it we'll do two and yet um yep totally lost the train of thought I think I was right at the alchem alchemical end of all thinking right there so uh if you could infer what I was going for and leave it in the comments that would be a big boon to human flourishing this one's called How to Give. When you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That's so dope. I should read the New Testament more often. 
Matthew, 6-3. The guy's a fan of Matthew. Uh, it is with charity as with happiness and holiness. It is not possible. Okay, this might be relevant to my self-internal struggles of aligning first order wants and... Um, yeah, same shit, same shit. Okay. It is not possible for you to say that you are happy because the moment you become consciousness of your happiness, you cease to be happy. This is a big uh, conundrum, a big paradox. I think that's one of the one of the squares that gets circled at whatever layer of development, to use that kind of language, I'm not yet at. And yet... Um, and yet uh, have ambitions towards um, seeing what it feels like to be able to so beautifully and sensitively hold so much complexity, which is something I am aware I'm able to do at an unusual level relative to mean human consciousness in terms of divesting from ideological and propositional uh, narratives don't mean a lot to me, and I, it's a wonderful Robert Keegan-like uh, space, and I want to continue to explore it and to move to the, the next space where that flow space is present, but maybe, I don't know, maybe, uh, yeah, I don't know how it all works, I don't know how I all work, I don't know what the future holds, is this charity, okay, uh, what am I saying? Which is charity and with happiness and holiness. It's not possible for you to say that you're happy because the moment you become conscious of your happiness, you cease to be happy. Right, and therein lies the uh, subject-object dichotomy of interior exteriority, of uh, I am the thing being the thing, and then becoming the thing, witnessing the thing being the thing. You cannot be the thing. And this is... Uh, you can. You can be both things. You're the holder and the held. I, I know these things, conceptually. It just, uh, I don't feel like the holder and the held. As I talk, I can get to that space at times through healthy introspection and uh, hedonistic access. Uh, what you call the experience of happiness is not happiness at all, but the excitement and thrill caused by some person or thing or event. True happiness is uncaused. You are happy for no reason at all, and true happiness cannot be experienced. It is not within the realm of consciousness. It is unself-consciousness. I'm not quite internalizing that. I get it, but so it is with holiness. The moment you're aware of your holiness, it goes sour and becomes self-righteous. Ain't that the truth? That fucked me up so hard when I was yeah, experiencing those kinds of energies a couple of months ago. A good deal that got me, uh, got me here in the first place. You watch uh, Ben of Meditation Number One. It's a, it's an intense energy. It's a, it's a holy energy. Um, it's difficult to, I was not able to navigate it and hold on to it. Help me, Anthony. A good deed, the moment you're aware of your holiness goes sour, becomes self-righteous. Ain't, yeah. A good deed is never so good as when you have no consciousness that it is good. You are so much in love with the action that you're quite unselfconscious about your goodness and virtue. Your left hand has no idea that your right hand is doing something good or meritorious. You, and you simply do it because it seems the natural, spontaneous thing to do. It's where I want to be. Spend some time in becoming aware of the fact that all the virtue that you can see in yourself is no virtue at all, but something you've cunningly cultivated and produced and forced on yourself. If it were real virtue, you would have enjoyed it thoroughly. It would feel so natural, and it wouldn't occur to you to think of it as a virtue. So the first quality of holiness is its unselfconsciousness. Second quality of it is effortlessness. Effort can change behavior. It cannot change you. Think of this. Effort can put food into your mouth. It cannot produce an appetite. It can keep you in bed. It cannot produce sleep. It can make you reveal a secret to another, but it cannot produce trust. It can force you to pay a compliment. It cannot produce genuine admiration. 
effort to perform acts of service. It is powerless to produce love or holiness. It's so beautiful. All you can achieve by your effort is repression. And not genuine change and growth. Change is not only brought about by awareness and understanding. Change, sorry, is only brought about by awareness and understanding. It excludes all of Understand your unhappiness and it will disappear. What result? What results is a state of happiness. Understand your pride and it will drop. The results will be humility. Right. You cannot will humidity, humility. You cannot will a state of happiness. Understand your fears and they will melt. The resulting state is love. Understand your attach, attachments and they will vanish. The consequence is freedom. Love and freedom and happiness are not things that you can cultivate and produce. You cannot even know what they are. All you can do is observe their opposites and, through your observation, cause these opposites to die. There's a third quality of holiness. It cannot be desired. If you desire, okay, what the fuck? If you desire happiness, you will be anxious lest you do not attain it. No, he's right, he's right, he's right. You will be constantly in a state of dissatisfaction, and dissatisfaction and anxiety kill the very happiness that they set out to gain. When you desire holiness for yourself, you feed the very greed and ambition that make you so selfishly and vainly unholy. Here's something you must understand. There are two sources for change within you. Give me something good, Aunt. One is the kindness of your ego that pushes you into making efforts to becoming something other than you're meant to be so that it can give itself a boost so that it can glorify itself. The other is the wisdom of capital N nature. Thanks to this wisdom, you become aware, you understand it. That is all you do. Leaving the change, type the manner, the speed, the time of the change to capital R, reality, and to capital N nature. I need to read that again. Thanks to this wisdom, you become aware, you understand it. That is all you do. Leaving the change, Type and nature, the speed, the time of the change to reality, into nature. I, God damn, dude. I hear that, and everything in me wants to hook onto it as an excuse to pursue impulsive ends. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. That is the insanity of the ego. Of the craving mind. And yet there's something about the deep truth of this that captures forgiveness. Ugh, the game. It's just like, mwah, I think. Your ego is a great technician, it cannot be creative goes in for methods and techniques and produces so-called holy people who are rigid, consistent, mechanical, lifeless, as intolerant of others as they are of themselves, violent people, the very opposite of holiness and love, the type of spiritual people who, conscious of their spirituality, then proceed to crucify the Messiah. Nature is not a technician. Nature is creative. You will be a creator. You good there, cat? Did you overeat? I think you probably overate. Gave too big a dinner. It's my fault. You will be a creator, not a wily technician when there is abandonment in you. There's always abandonment in me. Is that what craving is? Okay, nature is great. No greed, no ambition, no anxiety, no sense of striving, gaining, arriving, attaining. All there is is a keen, alert, penetrating, vigilant, awareness that causes the disillusion of all of one's foolishness and selfishness, all of one's attachments and fears. The changes that follow are not the result of your blueprints and effort, but the products of nature that spurns your plans and will, thereby leaving no room for a sense of merit or achievement or even any consciousness on the part of your left hand of what reality is doing by means of your right. I don't know if you're on any more camera. I don't know if I'm talking to myself or the eight people who might watch us later and get to this point. But uh, that's great. That's great. That's, that's the point. 
We're going to play a song, Barnes. <laughs> 